This is Near Death TV. I'm your host, Laura Ketchledge. I'm also an author. In 1979, I became a near-death experiencer. I chose to explain the truth I learned about the afterlife, reincarnation, and near-death experience through my fictional book series, The Near Death Saga. While dead, I was shown all human beings are shrouded in ignorance by design in order to learn valuable lessons in each incarnation. When you die, the artificial facade falls away and we awaken from the dream into reality. For more information, you can find us at neardeathtv.com. Please join us as we explore the after effects of near-death experience. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Near Death TV. I'm your host, Laura Ketchledge. Today we have a very special guest today. Um, Suzanne Giesman is an uh, international bestseller. She is a uh, international speaker and a mystic among many talents. Uh, Suzanne, thank you for coming on the show. Could you please tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Well, thanks, Laura. Uh, the one thing that you left out on that, that introduction is that I'm also a medium, which means that I talk to those who have been in physical form and are no longer in physical form. So people that others may think are dead and gone who are not. And if that immediately makes any of the people listening ready to change the channel or stop or label me woo woo, uh, the background is that I'm also a retired US Navy commander. I served 20 years in the Navy. And in my final job, I was aide to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. That's the, the right hand woman to the head of the entire United States military. But the funny thing is that at that time, I had no idea I would one day be working as a medium. So I might have raised my eyebrows, too. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, you have this uh, very, very um, formal background. You're very grounded uh, human being. This must have been a big shock when you had a terrible tragedy, number one, that led you to the afterlife. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, um, the tragedy to which you're referring is the very unexpected death of my stepdaughter, Susan, who was a sergeant in the Marine Corps and at 27 years old was reporting for duty one morning, crossing the flight line and out of the blue, a bolt of lightning struck her and killed her. So sorry. And uh, she was six months pregnant at the time. So we went from a very exciting time in our family's life to the most devastating time that we could imagine. And that's what really started me asking the questions that I had actually begun asking on 9-11 when I was aide to the chairman. But with Susan's death, I really needed to know, is death really the end or not, as many people say? Well, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, you know, when tragedy so unexpectedly happens, it's just un unnatural to lose a child. It's just, uh, just uh, like against the order of things. That's um, it. So what was your next step in your journey? Did you go to the Monroe Institute? Did you start getting uh, well read and well, well versed about the afterlife? What took you to that next level? What happened was at Susan's funeral, seeing her body in the coffin was a turning point in my life because it in no way resembled her. It was so lifeless, which may sound silly, but those who have been in the presence of a loved one's body know what I'm talking about. I just knew in that moment that Susan's spirit is what animated her body and that there must be a, an entity called a spirit and that if she still existed in any form, I was going to learn how to contact her. So that very week in 2006, I began meditating daily in hopes of somehow opening up a personal connection with Susan. And that practice led to everything that followed. So do you think you had this natural ability that had been repressed because, you know, come on, society 
you know, labels people that have near-death experience or have afterlife communication as wackadoos. I know that it's a latent ability in all of us. Whether or not we can open it up as much as I have, I do feel is dependent upon if it's your soul's calling. It's mo very clearly my purpose in life to now help people connect with their loved ones, teach people how to do so, but more importantly, to help people realize who we all are as eternal souls. When I read your uh, bio, uh, uh, Suzanne, I was so impressed because I think it took a lot of bravery, a lot of courage, a good idea of self to go public and share because you really wanted to help people that had tragedy, that had known loss. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that crossing over to actually talking about it? Yes, but I first just want to make the comment that every one of you listening today is a courageous soul who had the courage to come here and take on human life because that's the greatest challenge for all of us. And we face lots of challenges almost daily as humans, but that's how we grow. That's why we're here. So it was very challenging at first for me to say I am a medium aloud because it was so different from my background. And at that time I was worried about what people would think. But in the ensuing years, I've come to see the healing that takes place when people connect with loved ones. The preponderance of the evidence that I've received from those across the veil has taken away all doubt that this kind of communication is real and possible, so much so, and it has so shown me that we are souls and that love is our true purpose, that I don't care anymore what anybody thinks about me. I just care about being the presence of loving and helping others to find that. So that's <coughs> a huge transformation, personally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah when, uh, when you wrote, um, can you tell us a little bit about Still Right Here, this wonderful book out of the 13 that you've written? I know they can all be found on Amazon, but Still Right Here, I, you know, I read the jacket. It really struck a chord to me. <laughs> I'm actually up to 14 books now. They just keep flowing and I just take... <laughs> I just write what I'm shown I'm supposed to write. But still right here is a story that unfolded when I was at dinner with three other couples who have children across the veil, grown children. And it became very clear at that dinner when all four of the kids, no, three of the four kids, because the other couple came later, dropped in on us at the table and gave us evidence of things going on in each of our lives that day that the kids were at the party too. And we came to realize that we all had this bond because of our shared stories. And so these four couples with kids across the veil got together for a week on a sailing charter trip, but our kids went along too. So here are four couples that really didn't know each other that well. And I have never spent seven days in such close quarters with relative strangers surrounded by so much love because all of us understood what, what it's really all about being here. And our yeah. kids were along on that trip and the evidence is throughout the book. And so, yes, it's a story, but it's a true story filled with hope for anybody who reads it that even though your loved ones have passed, they're still part of your everyday life. I think that's just such a, a, a beautiful, moving way to put it. Um, I always say to people, it's, you know, when you make that transition, you know, you're still you, and that, you know, the love is just as strong as the day they left between you. Um, it's very, very important that uh, people read books like still right here. I mean, yes, that, those kinds of stories and the evidence for those like I was in the past who need that verifiable information about someone who passed that the medium couldn't possibly know. That's what opens minds and, mm -hmm. and opens our hearts to what's possible. It's always been my theory that after a near-death experience, especially for myself, that you know, when you return, you have better abilities, uh, more empathy, 
you know, you've seen the truth, you've actually been there. So it's a, it's a known and not belief. What is the similarity between a medium and a near-death experiencer? I completely agree with you, Laura, about the, the wonderful uh, silver lining of having those near-death experiences. The beautiful thing is that any of us can access the higher consciousness that you came in contact with during your NDE. And for a medium, we access the next level of higher reality, I would call it, the astral realm where our loved ones reside, but we can also learn to have adventures and consciousness beyond the astral realm. Mm -hmm. So the, the beauty is that when you, when you merge with that higher energy regularly, in my case daily, I get daily messages from higher beings and post them online, it changes us. It gives us a whole new perspective on life and this sense of peace and joy that that is unfortunately rarely found in the human world. Well, do you, um, let's say you're with, with someone and you're trying to reach over, you're trying to assist them, they've had a lot, you know, lost a, a loved one. Do you hear it auditory? Do you have um, like flashes of information in front of you or do you see the actual person? How, does, how do your senses uh, perceive this? Oh, I teach mediumship and one of the first things that any mediumship teacher shares is what we call the clairs. Clairaudience, that means hearing, clairvoyance, seeing. Uh, clairsentience is feeling and claircognizance is you just know. And my readings happily are a combination, a flow, a dance of all of those senses working in concert so that you get the full picture through all of the senses of who is here and what they want to share. So some of it's fleeting, some of it's flowing. Every reading is different depending on the mix of energy with the medium, the sitter, that's the recipient of the messages and those in spirit. Well, that's very amazing. Um, have you, you know, in your many years of doing this, have you had any messages that turned out to be a life-saving event? Oh, one of my favorites was a woman who was referred to me by her physician because the physician didn't know how else to help her. She was in such a dark place, uh, grieving. And so she, the woman didn't tell me who had passed, but she sat down and I said, well, you have a husband across the veil. He's right here. And he told me all kinds of things about how he passed. He mentioned that his wife was, he was proud of her because she was traveling to England soon. The first time she was traveling without him. She's looked at me, she said, how do you know that? And I said, because he's right here telling me these things. Amazing connection with her husband, full of evidence. But in answer, direct answer to your question, Laura, Near the end of the reading, that husband said, and I've said it like this to her, your husband is saying, don't you dare take those pills in your purse. And she looked at me with shock and said, on the way here, I stopped at the drugstore and bought enough pills to do myself in if I didn't hear from my husband. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah. wow, that double wow. So um, there, there is a responsibility that goes with this work yeah. to get the messages accurately, to hear what those across the veil want to say. And that's why I'm, I'm very, very much a stickler when I train other mediums to really work on their discernment. Yes, because there is a responsibility. And these yeah. people, you know, that you're um, trying to help, they've had a tremendous shock and tragedy. And, you know, they're a lot more sensitive to... Uh, yeah. Anything you say? Not all of them are in that place of grief. Many are, but sometimes I get these readings where people already know there's an afterlife. They've had their own signs from their loved ones and they just want to hear from them through a medium who might get different pieces of their, their of the puzzle, we say. And so I call those my happy family reunions and they're just, they're fun, they're joyous, as long as it was a functional family. But as we all know, not everybody had a functional family. So when you get families who were dysfunctional, that is equally important to those across the veil because they get to issue their apologies, uh, their mm -hmm. thank yous to tell why they acted the way they did. The, the dynamics of the readings are absolutely fascinating. So if you have, you know, if you've gone out of body, have you made it to different consensus realities? You know, you call it going out of body, but I never 
have looked down on my body. I'm not aware that I've left my body. This body is a, is a projection of consciousness just as my self-consciousness is. So I actually don't feel I need to leave it. I just have these adventures in consciousness and have gone to, uh, I don't go anywhere. I just experience different levels of beings. That's a good way to put it. That's very unique and that, that's just very impressive. Um, in your book, Wolf's Message, can you tell us a little bit about this book? It just looked delicious to read. Oh my gosh, all I can tell you is, well, I can tell you a lot, but the first uh, caution is if you're, go if you're drawn to read this book, buckle your seatbelt because it serves as a, one, uh, one of the reviewers said it's like an oracle. It helps you see things in your life that you need to see. People who read this book email me all the time and say, oh my God, I'm having all these synchronicities that things I'm reading in the book are happening in my life now. Or I know somebody just like Wolf, who was a young man who crossed and came back from across the veil with stunning evidence that it was him, but with a message for all of humanity that was hidden in his reading. So the book is actually reads like a spiritual mystery, a metaphysical mystery, because I gave a reading to his parents and it was very accurate, scored by Dr. Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona, an afterlife researcher, as incredibly accurate, including a visit before the actual reading when Wolf dropped in on me. I knew nothing about him, but he proved that it was him. But certain things in that reading didn't make sense so how could so much of it be accurate and his parents couldn't identify certain bits and pieces that he shared? Well, those bits and pieces came together over the ensuing three months and the story just unravels the thread, revealing at the end this message for all of us about how we as a species, and I know you'd all agree, are out of balance We're as with our true nature. We're just way too much in the head and we need to bring the heart the knowing sense of our soul back into things so that we can find the peace and tranquility that is our birthright. Um, what are your views about shared death experience? I haven't personally experienced one, but I've certainly interviewed enough people on my weekly radio show who have had them that I know it's a very real phenomenon. However, as I said that, I was just reminded, I just got a little ding from one of my guides, that I did have a shared death experience with my beloved dog last Christmas. What kind of, was it a dachshund? What are the dachshunds? Yeah, yeah, little black and tan dachshund Gretchen. Oh. At, at, we we uh, helped her across the veil. As a matter of fact, Wolf's stepmother is a veterinarian and she's the one that came to our house to help Gretchen pass because she was in so much pain. And I did not expect what happened. I mean, we were solemn. And at the moment when the medicine kicked in, all of a sudden I felt this little burst. I have goosebumps right now, this burst of energy. I felt Gretchen, I heard her say, I'm free, I'm free. And she whipped around me three times and then went whooshing, whooshing away with so much joy that I burst into happy tears. And my husband and Beth, the doctor, looked at me like, what's going on? And I said, she's right here. She just crossed and let me know she's okay. And they started crying because the reaction was so unexpected. Well, I thank you for sharing that beautiful experience being a serious pet lover. I think it's uh, very comforting to so many of us. Um, the lesson, the biggest lesson that you have learned, you know, after this terrible tragedy in your life, um, can you tell us about that? Oh, it's just so succinct that we are just, as Joel Goldsmith, the, the author, wrote, one parenthesis, our life is a parenthesis in all eternity. We are not these limited separate beings that we seem to be in these bodies, but aspects, extensions, emanations of one mind, one light of consciousness. So as we realize this and rise above the drama that we're living here, we can find peace. We can find understanding for why we go through what we go through. We can find compassion for each other as we connect at that higher level beyond these stories and know 
that love never dies. Well, I think that is wonderful. Um, wonderfully said. Can you give me uh, your opinion? Have you ever had access to some of your past lives or uh -huh. have been with um, someone that you're trying to help and you've accessed perhaps a, a past life with them? Yes, being that former Navy commander and still have that kind of uh, prove it to me mentality. Oh, yeah. I, in, I, in the past, did not give credence to past lives. I was open to it, which is very important, but I needed the evidence. And I was shown evidence of past life in meditation. My spirit guide, who I also used to not believe in, but he has certainly proven himself over and over, several of them, uh, showed me that he and I shared this particular past life and he actually gave me evidence that I found about that life online. Uh, others have come through in readings. They don't get it too often, but when they do share evidence, it's, it's pointing to characteristics that the client has now that I couldn't know about and then showing them that that relates to issues they've had in other incarnations. So it's, it's a fascinating field, but not my specialty. But I think it's, uh, it's, uh, mind-blowing to me you know it's it's god's ultimate recycled plan you know well it certainly yeah. shows us why certain things happen here if we only had one go at it, it uh, things wouldn't make as much sense as they do you could never learn in one lifetime what the soul needs to do to progress yeah. Well, yeah. we're here to become self-aware beings like all of the other levels above us. And self-aware means aware that we are consciousness and expression, awareness and expression, love and expression. And I'll tell you, look around you. Most people aren't aware of that because they're not acting in that way. So if you realize that uh, that's your purpose, we're here to live fully and to love fully. And that gives us a responsibility. It certainly does. I think it's very generous of you, Suzanne, to put online, and I, I read it, Awakening, a Lesson from Beyond the Veil. Could you tell us a little bit about that book and just, you know, freeing it up for the general public to read? Sure. I try to put all kinds of free things on my website, tons of videos and free meditations. And um, that ebook, Awakening, is right on the home page down at the bottom and also on the books page. And it's a guide to what it, what it, what this life is all about, what awakening is about. But it also at the end, it contains an incredible download that I got from spirit in the middle of a flight and just took dictation and typed as fast as I could a 12 page download about what the afterlife is like and the different levels we go through as we rise through the ranks, as it were. I think that, I, I really enjoyed reading it. I think it was very, informative and I consider myself fa fairly well read but I learned something new and I think that is what I, I so much gravitate towards your books because you're showing something new explaining something new can you tell us a little bit about your radio show and the guests you have on I will but I just want to tell you right now test everything you learn from anyone in your heart I had somebody reached out to me through my daily blog today saying, hey, I read this channel message from somebody else and it really scares me. And do I, should I believe this? Can you check with your guides? And I read it and it just, it was so fear-based. And I said, you know, you reached out to me because your heart already knows the answer. Anything that's fear-based is not in alignment with our true nature. It doesn't mean that we don't feel fearful and act on that, but just test everything in your heart. Uh, the radio show is with Unity Online Radio, and it's every week. Uh, it's live Thursdays at 4 o'clock Eastern, but boy, there are almost three years of shows in the archives. I love it, Laura, when people tell me they've been binge listening to my show. That, <laughs> they, they do seem to get things out of it. I have most of uh, I have a lot of people who've had NDEs come on. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of what we would call very ordinary people, but people who've gone through tragedies and, and overcome them. So they have a lot to share with us. And uh, the first Thursday of every month, I answer questions from callers. Oh, I think that's great. That is a must listen to show. Um, in some of your other books, what can people find? What, what are they about? There's 13. So could you tell us about three of your other books and what is the message in the storyline? Yes, my, my, 
one of my favorites is Messages of Hope, which is the memoir of how I came to this work as a medium. It tells about my experiences on 9-11 and then Susan's passing and the whole transformation and how the evidence changed my whole worldview. Uh, let's see, that and Wolf's Message are also on audiobooks. Very happy about that. Uh, it's really funny that I actually wrote a book called Conquer Your Cravings. It was my very first book back in 1997. A lot of people don't know that I wrote that one. And uh, I would say that it did not go into as much depth as my spiritual understanding now because I didn't have any then. I was referring to intuition and self-help, but it was a good place to start. Uh, one of my favorites is The Priest and the Medium, the biography of a wonderful medium named Anne Gaiman, who is married to a former Jesuit priest, Wayne Knoll. It's a beautiful love story, but how a priest and a medium could come together and reconcile their different worldviews and still be united by love. It, that's my Hay House book, and uh, people just seem to really love that story, and no wonder. <laughs> do you have a YouTube channel? Oh, I sure do. We have about uh, overnight, almost 20,000 subscribers to that now, and boy, I just keep putting the videos up there, so I hope people will check it out and subscribe because we try to put quality information on there. Well, you know what I think? Um, because of the... Uh, near-death experience people um people are coming back literally from the dead because of advanced medical you know you know you've got cpr you've got adrenaline shots so people are coming back in record numbers like never before in history um and kind of telling the same story that there is a continuation existence of existence after physic after physical death do you think this has impacted society a lot or do you think that there's just a natural craving for spiritual awakening? I would say more the latter, definitely the former. It's impacting society because people can talk about these now without being labeled crazy. More and more people are coming to know about it. And it's a phenomenon that now when people mention it, uh, people understand what the term means. In fact, um, you know, I've spoken at multiple conferences for the International Association of Near-Death Studies, and the group grows every year. It's really a commonplace thing now. But more than that, I know that people are hungry for a spiritual awakening, for information about the greater reality, because we're becoming so restless with what we've been doing until now, which isn't working. And that's working as separate people, thinking that we're we're you know, we're all in it for ourselves and not understanding the underlying reality. I got the biggest uh, wake up call after my near death experience because it was 40 years ago. There was nobody to talk to, nothing to yeah. read. The isolation was profound. And I still think that, you know, in the hospitals, doctors will shame the patients when they try to talk about it and family members kind of don't want to hear it. I think it takes a special person that is credible like yourself to make people feel comfortable with talking about near-death experience and the existence of self out of body. Well, I, I feel that it's part of the evolution that we have more and more people with the credible backgrounds. Not that other people who have spoken about this aren't credible, but there's something in the human makeup that they have to have somebody in a position of supposed authority. So I feel that when I look at my background, I see it was part of some plan that I didn't have any idea that this was coming so that I would have this very rigid uh, military background serving absolutely at the highest level mm -hmm. so that now when I speak, it's so rewarding when people say, I heard your story or I watched your documentary on YouTube. The Messages of Hope documentary is, is filled with images of that time and, and we recreated certain scenarios and they say, I wasn't ready to believe, but I watched that and I can believe now. And that's the blessing in it. Well, I think so too. But well, Suzanne, you know, you're beautiful, educated, you come from good people. You know, yeah. you went in to give a service to your country and now you're giving service to humanity in a different form. People yeah. do find you credible and well-spoken and educated. And I think they'll be gravitating to you even more and more as the years go by. So to buy your books, do you have a page on Amazon for all of the 13 slash 14 books? 
Oh, certainly. They can just search my name on Amazon and they all come up. So that's and it's Giesman. I said Geisman, but it's Giesman like Geist. <laughs> Got this. Giesman. <laughs> yeah, Giesman. I'm terrible. I'm so dyslexic. You know, I mean, I'm always screwing up my, even my own name. But, you know, uh, even if I misspell my own last name with fumble fingers, it still comes up on Amazon. So they've got that figured out. <laughs> do you feel like, you know, with some of your guides, and we all have guides around us, most of us can't perceive them or don't even acknowledge that, you know, that they exist. Do, have you felt them giving you advice, putting you, telling you a different direction with your oh life? Oh my gosh, like every that? Every day, every day. It's stunning. In fact, my new book, uh, you should see my study downstairs. I, the way I write a book is the guides give me so much information that I put every little piece on an index card and then I put them in order on the floor. And so I have this rows and rows and rows. That's how I organize it. Then I make my outline. I'm in the middle of that now for a new book. But the guides are so real and it's a shame when people don't recognize how much they're trying to help us. So one thing we haven't mentioned is I have a series of CDs or MP3s as well, put together by Hemisync. Those are also on my website, the Hemisync CDs. One of them is called Getting to Know Your Spirit Guides. And there's the most wonderful exercise in there where I take you into an expanded state of awareness mm -hmm. and I ask you to notice how you feel. And then you, the participant, asks all of your guides to step out of your energy field, kind of backwards from the way we normally do it when you ask your guides to step in. Well, we're going under the realization that your guides are always with you. So you ask them to step out and now notice the difference. And the feedback I get from people doing this exercise is stunning. They absolutely feel a difference. Then you ask them in this guided meditation to step in one at a time and get to know them. It's really fascinating. And with the added hemisync audible tones, it helps people to stay in that yeah. deeper state and have a truly phenomenal experience. People should read the, the feedback, the reviews on those hemisync recordings and you'll know why I'm saying this. Well, I, you know, when I was, I went to a therapist, you know, because I had seen um, a friend after he died and had some really, I just had to finally talk about it. You know, this is like 1985 and my NDE was in 78. Um, and I was so lucky to find a therapist that uh, led me to Robert Monroe's books. Oh, which led great. me to, to Hemisync. And I've been doing the Hemisync for years and years. So oh, I love it. I, I, I have a new step to it. A new series coming out in January, and this is the very first time I'm announcing it, but it's all about, it's a new series other than the mediumship series on uh, tools for awakening. And this first recording was given to me by my guides just uh, in the middle of the night recently. And it's all about helping you to really get to know your fundamental nature as an expression of the light. I, I teach mediumship classes at the Monroe Institute, so I can't wait for them to start doing in-person classes again because that is a very special place oh i know i'm glad when covid's over I, I i was booked for and had prepaid for going to gateway uh and of course you know life st steps in when you make great plans and then COVID happened but yeah. the binaural beats and uh doing these cds of yours i think could really really help so many people what is the difference between a medium and just a person that is psychic. We all have that ability, but psychic means that you're turning, tuning into consciousness, information and energy at this bandwidth of consciousness on the whole spectrum, meaning the human level. So you're picking up information about your fellow humans in physical form. However, a medium gets that information and the higher levels as well. So, so you're going past the M field. Yeah, so it's just yeah. a, a upgrade, a finer tuning or a different channel on that radio band. Well, that is, um, what about a, a sensitive person? What is the definition of a person that is sensitive? I would equate that with being an empath, and that means you're aware of the energies that are around us beyond the physical energy. So you sense when somebody's not in a good mood or you pick up on their thoughts and 
most of us have that to some degree, but a sensitive person or a highly sensitive person can be thrown off balance by that as well. You know, uh, Suzanne, I've also found, you know, through interviewing um, uh, near-death experiencers that after their NDE, uh, you know, years pass, they keep getting clues, different messages, different abilities, very random and sort of uh, overwhelming. Mm. Um, can you kind of explain that to the listener? Sure. It's because something within them has opened up because they had that higher experience, the, the bit of the filter that the brain puts over our sensing abilities is opened up. That filter is not quite as restricted. And now they're having all this higher vibrational energy carrying information coming in in a way that they weren't used to. That, so that can be unsettling. And that's why I, I just love teaching because I show people how to raise your consciousness to open that filter in a methodical way, how to interpret the energy, how to deal with the higher vibrations. Well, experiencing your higher self or source, whatever you want to call it, um, is such a, a, a shift and you, your whole psyche has shift after the return. Um, when you've talked to people, but how have they processed that? You know, you, you know all these people, you've helped them yeah. for years. Um, what was their struggle in processing that after, after their return? Well, what's interesting is how many of them were actually depressed when they came back because once you've tasted that bliss and that love and that light, to come back here and squeeze your expansive energy into this, it's not like the physical body is actually restricting the soul. The spirit energy is, is not physical, but it is filtered. It is limited by this vessel we call a body. And to know what you know, whatever they're allowed to remember when they come back into physical form, is it's like going on vacation, having the time of your life and coming back and going to work on Monday morning, but to 10,000 times different, right? Oh yes, you know, it's such a letdown um, yeah. coming back and, and or even in, um, when you have connected some, with someone that you love and then you come back to physical reality, it's a huge letdown. You know, everyone says that, you know, they just want that five minutes with a loved one that has passed. Oh, if I could just have that five minutes, but I don't think they really think it through. Yes, you can have that five minutes, but coming back, the grief is still with you. It is, but just like after a reading with, a, with an evidential medium that convinces you that was my loved one, which by the way is the test of a good reading, you, you are still changed by the experience. There's not a single near-death experiencer that I've interviewed who was not changed for the better by it because now you know there's something more. Now you know your life has purpose. Those who are grieving a loved one, now they know their loved one is not gone forever. Now they know they will see them again. So grieving is part of our soul's evolution. We are here for the full experience of being fully human. If you push that down and don't allow yourself to feel it, you're missing out on one of the, the, opportunities to grow that we came here for. So when we can accept these dark experiences here, the depression, the grief, and know that it's part of our wholeness, then it becomes somehow easier. Well, I think that's very, very well said. Um, I'm going to close out the show. Is uh, there any message that you want to uh, tell people? Yes especially in these somewhat chaotic times, once you realize that you are not only human, you then face a choice that you can stay stuck in your story or take the higher perspective of the soul, which has always been here, but now is out in the open in your awareness. So you learn to be flexible and say, I'm going to play along with this story, but I'm not going to get dragged down by it. So learn to be flexible in your point of view, and you will be able to access the peace that's always here. It's not something external to you. Well, that is a fantastic message. And what I was so attracted to after I, I, I went to your website and I read your book, Jack, and, and the po being positive and having the hope, but you're also very realistic and grounded. And I think people gravitate towards you because they want that common sense person. Hmm. 
to explain things and to help them. That's and my goal is to put things in, in terms that we can all relate to and understand. They're not woo-woo, they're not out there. It, they make sense so that we can use it now so that we can be in this world, but not of it. I would call you the practical medium. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much. Everyone, you've got to go to Amazon and get her books and get go on the website. And thank you for being on the show. It's an honor to any time I get to share and help people understand more. So thank you, Laura. Many Take thanks. Care. Good day. Thank you for listening. The Near Death Saga books, Near Death Connection, Throwaway Horses, and Reincarnation Connection can all be found on Amazon. Or you can go to theneardeathsaga.com to read book previews. For more Near Death TV interviews, go to neardeathtv.com. Thank you.